This is Joe Dancy with Texas A&M Law Online Program. I'm the senior lecturer at the uh, at the law school. Excellent. Thanks for joining us here, Provolone. Appreciate you patching him through, Mr. Joe Dancy. And I uh, wanted to bring you in here a little bit early before our interview because I wanted to see if you had a second or two to go over some headlines. Uh, just the last one we have here where we can... Uh, get your input on what's going on up in the state of Alaska, but also it's a, a bigger problem, w- w- which is going on. And l- let me get to it in just a second here. So the headline reads, see, what we do on the on the Crude Life podcast is we like to uh, do headlines, but we read the headlines like the average person where we just read the headline and then two paragraphs and make, make a, a judgment about the facts of it and move on. We don't read anymore. We just read the first two paragraphs and move on. <laughs> That's the way the average person reads today. So um, the headline is, Petitions in Favor of Raising Oil and oil Taxes Submitted. And this has been one we've been kind of following a little bit. Uh, supporters of a voter initiative to raise oil taxes on the large slope oil fields turned in 44,624 signatures on petitions to Lieutenant Governor Kevin Meyer's office January 17th. Uh, it's Anyway, and the next paragraph goes on to talk about how it's more than what they needed, but it's in Alaska. And this is interesting, um, and I, I, I want to get your perspective on this. On one hand, you've got uh, states and political parties and activists putting more taxes towards oil and gas on the ballot. This is happening in many states. And then on the other hand, you got essentially the same individuals trying to ban the industry. I think it's just, it's, it's amazing time we live in. So do uh, you got any comments on kind of what's going on there with the uh, movement to tax the industry more and, uh, you know, ban them in certain counties and restrictions and everything like that? Well, that's not unusual. Actually, I think uh, somebody sent me a note. Uh, in, of course, in Colorado, we've had that. Uh, movement for quite some time in New Mexico. Someone told me Michigan, uh, you know, somebody's raising it on the on the ballot up there. We're trying to. Uh, one of the things in Alaska that I, I will I will relay a couple things I know about. I haven't I don't keep track of their state budget, Jason, but I do know um, the state universities up there are in a world of hurt financially. Now, how they got there, I mean, there's a lot of universities that are in a world that hurt financially, but how they got there, I, you know, I'm not sure, but there's a, a real concern and viability with regard to, you know, some of their sports programs and some of their programs that they might have to cut back. And actually, this happened in North Dakota a few years ago, too, as I recall. I mean, it's been a, several years. A part of the deal is, is just like North Dakota, Alaska is, you know, they're heavy in the oil revenues. And when you have oil prices you know, below where you think they're going to be. And, you know, let's be, let's face it, it's, they're a lot more robust oil prices than they have been, but it's nothing like the 80 or 90 or hundred dollar a barrel oil we saw a few years ago. So if you do your budgeting based on, you know, $75 a barrel oil and it comes in at 60 or 55 average. And, and actually, I think I just saw or I read, I think Mexico actually has, hedges its future oil production and for this year i think they hedged i'm gonna say it was around fifty dollars so i thought that was awful low but then again they know they're gonna get it they um so so alaska you know wanting to raise it it is sort of interesting um because as you know when you tax things more you get less of them and so you if you start throwing taxes at the energy sector you probably get, you know, it makes the economics look less attractive, so you have less completions, less drilling. And the other big thing, and I didn't realize this, God, it's been several years ago, with the, the major pipeline that comes down, you know, apparently as that field depletes up there, the the pace of that oil slows significantly. So when you get into January like you get now, you know, if that stuff ever freezes, you're going to have a popsicle that you're going to be, you know, a, um, I don't know how many hundreds of miles a long popsicle, but you won't be able to unfreeze it. I mean, it's pretty much uh, frozen solid. And I had not realized that. And this was a few years ago. They were concerned that, you know, before when you 
had the pumps running, everything stayed really warm because you were really jacking the uh, production through and the heat was maintained. But now it's gotten to be slow enough that, uh, or was several years ago, they were concerned that, gee, if we had a mechanical breakdown, you know, we would have this huge, you know, this huge um, <laughs> budsicle full of uh, crude oil that's stuck up there. So that's, you know, whether that's still an issue or not, I don't know. But I, I assume it is because I, I haven't heard of any, you know, major increase in the volumes going through that uh, the system up there. So it's uh, interesting. So those are my, my thoughts on it. And, and, the, uh, the, the other thing I wanted to mention about this that I found interesting was uh, this is a, a measure, a voter initiative to go on the ballot. Okay, and that part is, is rather interesting because uh, in Alaska, it's state-owned oil. That's why everybody gets a check uh, of what are the oil rebate check? A lot of people wonder, well, how come we can't do that? Well, it's set up differently. A lot of the state constitutions are set up certain ways, and you'd have to change all these different things. And so, essentially, the way the Alaska uh, system is set up, my understanding is, is that the state is, owns the oil, and then when there's a rebate check, that's why the Alaskans get that that check. But the the disadvantage of that is is essentially there's just two companies that drill up there, and Vicki Steiner from uh, North Dakota, she was the president of the uh, Western Dakota Energy Association for a long time, uh, still very active, state legislator as well for a number of years. She spoke out there and she said it's very difficult to get anything done with the energy industry because it has to go through Congress. It has to go through the state legislature. And you know how that goes. I mean, huh? it, it, it could yeah. take seven years to get one permit approved. So they basically only deal with two companies up in Alaska. So I find it interesting that the people who don't deal with the energy companies on a day-to-day -day basis are now saying, we want more. And let's go after oil and gas. I tell you, every time you turn around, it seems like they're the whipping boy. Yeah, that's really true. It's uh, whipping it's, post. Uh, whipping post. Whipping sorry. Post. <laughs> yeah, with the whipping boy. I, I knew what you meant. But essentially, the uh, it is interesting and it's somewhat um, discouraging because oil and gas, you know, means so much to the country economically, and we have private mineral ownership and. It is um, it is interesting to see, and it's across the board, really. And the, I think what is resulting, uh, in my opinion, in the last five years, is you're seeing a lot of capital being reallocated to areas other than oil and gas. I mean, whether it's technology, whether it's medical, whether it's renewables. Now, whether it's renewables, you know, whether they're economic or not, it's I got a big kick out of things, Jason. You hear the the people saying, "Oh yeah, wind power is less." You know, I actually I told my class this today, and I showed them statistics that some people you know say, "Oh, wind power, you know, we can generate electricity cheaper than natural gas, a natural gas plant, solar the same way." And then you tell them, "Well, what if we take off those tax credits?" Like, "Oh, you can't do that; it'll bankrupt the industry." Well, you know, if you have a thirty percent tax credit on the federal level, you know, for essentially uh, um, right up front for renewables. And then you throw on the state of Texas or state of Oklahoma or state of Kansas um, additional tax credits. And then, you know, clearly you're, you can be economic if, if the government or the state government or federal government or local government, if they're paying for your project, um, Hell, it is, it's perfectly economic. I, the perfect example is I was just up in Upper Michigan last weekend. Actually, we're looking to maybe set up an energy center up there at the university with a bunch of professors. But I went up there and at the high school, they installed in August a $25,000 uh, solar array to generate electricity. And it worked through about the end of December until it started snowing. They haven't generated any power for the first like 20 days of January. And of course, you know, people are like, what's the economics must be terrible. Well, if somebody, a foundation paid for the, uh, the installation and they, so the economics are, you know, you're making, you're real profitable when someone else pays to install it. You know, you get any power out at all. It's, you know, oh man, it's a hundred percent profit here, except it, but it's it a good, it is a good example for the, uh, high school students up there who are running, apparently they're running some 
studies on it just to show you, I mean, it'll really indicate um, if you did have to put $25,000 up, what type of, you know, real output you would have. And it, it, it will be completely, it'd be very limited. I think this month and next, cause it was, they're totally snow covered. The, uh, the panels. <laughs> and they don't produce anything. They don't produce anything. And actually they have a, the neat thing is they put a, you know, it's a public, you know, high school. And, uh, so they have a public site where you can go check daily what type of output they have in the entire month of January so far they have zero watts um and in December they actually had a few watts and then you know August was was actually pretty pretty impressive although I you know I ran the numbers and even even if it was like August the entire year round you're not you know you're not getting you're not getting a super payout on uh solar energy the the killer up up there and um that's positive. It has some of the most expensive electricity anywhere in the United States outside of California. So it's easy to you know, compete with. And the second thing is um, the system, it's such a rural area that the system goes down quite a few times. So a lot of people who, who live, it's like probably, you know, North Dakota may have this issue, but um, you know, a lot of these small towns, the power goes out, you know, once or twice a week for a couple hours. And some people put in a, a backup generator and so instead of a backup generator they put on they put in solar and some lithium batteries but you know the lithium batteries aren't cheap either you're adding you're adding substantial amounts just to keep your your power on for a couple hours when everything goes out so but it is interesting to see and like i say the uh now whether that's where we ought to be allocating capital and technology or whether maybe we ought to be you know designing better wind or better um natural gas turbines and natural gas, you know, electrical grid systems. Um, you know, Lord knows I, I, we've talked about this before. I really do think even though natural gas is part of the, the target, um, along with oil, I think natural gas, if we proceed correctly, has a tremendous potential for both heating, electrical generation, you know, essentially manufacturing, uh, facilities etc but the you know whether we can get there or not i i don't know it'll be interesting to see what these with these um and i tell you and i and i have to just throw on the top of the last guy i heard you know colorado apparently is going to try to you know the the proposition that they threw out here a couple of years ago they're going to try to get it back on the ballot so i mean sooner or later you know sooner or later well you know, we'll talk, you yeah, know. let's let's talk more about that in a second because there's they've got six initiatives they're they're going around. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, natural gas and flaring, and um, also some events that you have coming up. But uh, I got to take a quick pause here. Also uh, coming around the horn with Joe Dancy, our energy uh, educator and expert. We're going to talk about a little social media where. Uh, seen an increased amount in the last three, four months of people posting not the positive ones, but the negative posts on social media. Who owes who owes money and who's breaking contracts and heck, who knows who's probably doing things to puppies and and everything like that too, because it's it's getting kind of nasty out there in, in some parts of the world. But we're gonna. Check with Joe Dancy, energy educator. He, since he's involved with the law, he might have an opinion or two. We'll be right back here on the Crude Life Podcast. Welcome back to the Crude Life Podcast. My name is Jason Spies. We have Joe Dancy on our Bach and Barbecue phone lines here. Uh, Joe Dancy, thank you for waiting through that uh, 45 seconds of sponsorships. Appreciate that very much. But we got to, you know, not only do we got to pay the bills, we got to inform people how the light switch turns on. That's going to be our motto going forward, I think. That's not I a bad like, thing. I, I like that. Well, and that brings up our, kind of where I'm going with our one of our topics here, which is, you know, I've said this before, that I think the energy industry is going through a period right now that the agriculture industry went through when grocery stores came about to where pretty soon city folks started realizing that uh, food came from the grocery store, not from the farms anymore, not from the slaughterhouses or the render, rendering plants or anything like that. And so I think that the light switch is the grocery store where people just assume that the, the circuit breaker and the light switch is where energy comes from. 
And in Colorado, they've got six petitions circulating around so that Colorado Rising can choose which one best suits uh, for the uh, upcoming election. Uh, Air, Alaska, we just mentioned in the last segment, is going to have a ballot uh, initiative on there to raise taxes against the energy industry. California, Oregon, Idaho also is going to have something on the ballot. Mentioned Michigan to where some of the cities, Fargo, Austin, uh, New, the state of New York. I mean, now that's just off the top of my head. That's without even doing a Google search for crying out loud. Point is, uh, the conversation is happening. The governments are getting involved and it's not going in the most favorable way for energy. So uh, I'm going to hand the baton over to you and let you d just see which way you go with that loaded baton. That's not, I didn't even ask a question in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you what, I, I know a number of uh, companies and people with companies in Colorado. And even though the last, um, petition or last um uh, oh geez suggested ordinance or whatever they were voting on i can't remember exactly how the what they call that up there jason but even though it was voted down i can tell you a lot of people that are investing money you know you, get, you just don't want to drill a well you take leases and you don't take this one lease you take dozens of leases covering you know thousands of acres because you don't want to drill one well and end up you know, getting a good well and having all your competitors walk in. But before you tie up the capital, you want to make sure that your um, business environment is either good or at least fair. And it's tough to say, you know, at least this is what my Colorado buddies tell me, it's tough to say that the environment in Colorado, this is just one example, New Mexico, you could probably say the same thing here. It's tough to say they have a good business environment for oil and gas when, like you say, you have a half dozen um, petitions essentially to, you know, to put on the ballot that you know will shut down the industry or tax the industry or restrict the industry. And what you're doing, I mean, you may, you're just making things, you know, more expensive. Not that there aren't certain things that need to be addressed and mentioned earlier like flaring uh colorado flaring is not a huge issue in colorado or new mexico it is the issue in texas the issue in north dakota but um but you know looking at all this and and the other interesting thing and i point this out to um, my students that take energy law is you know in the united states we have sort of a unique system and we were founded on the principle that when you have private property you have private rights that are protected to a large extent from the government if you have um you have a you have title to both the surface and the minerals from the center of the earth to the skies you can inherit it you can sell it you can convey it um you can do whatever you want with the property you know subject to the regulatory powers and the the state can regulate but they can't take your property they can't come in and say hey you know move out we're going to make a new parking lot for the school or or build a new school, I can, I can tell you that, but they have to pay you for it. And, um, and that's one of the problems you have with some of these uh, initiatives is they're, you know, they're really sort of taking your rights or some of your rights. And, you know, I don't see the state of Colorado saying, yeah, we're not going to allow drilling, but we'd be happy to spend the hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars to compensate everybody for the lost lease bonuses they won't get or the lost oil royalties that they won't get. Or the lost jobs that you won't have, but uh, anyway, it's uh, it, there's some real interesting. What am I missing here? Well, I mean, what, what what am I missing? I try to, you know, try, I I really try to see the other side as much as I can. I try to empathize with the other side as much as I can, and if I even can, I'll sympathize with the other side. That doesn't mean I'm going to side with them, but I'll definitely have. Uh, an open mind, etc. Now, what I don't get here is when it comes to the ban on energy and what they're trying to do. I, I don't understand how they don't understand how they don't see it would be just a complete disruption of their day to day lifestyle. When when people say we'd be, we'd be thrown back to the Stone Ages, that is more accurate than people would want to admit, and that that is it. That is true. That 
96% of the things that we use on a day-to-day basis are made with petroleum products. That's, that's just a fact of life. So if we ban the industry, we get through, okay, I get that. They, they, they don't see the, the, the amount of taxes that are drawn to it as well. Okay, and when it comes to the science, when it comes to the, the exponentiality of the way processors and the speed happens and Moore's law, et cetera, it doesn't happen in energy that way. It happens in computers that way and in certain things, but it, it doesn't happen in other things like energy. I mean, so um, where I'm coming from in all of this, I guess, is <clears throat> where, I, <clears throat> where I see their strategy winning, and I do think they're winning, where I see their strategy winning is because the energy industry, oil and gas, in my opinion, hasn't figured out that this is a public health debate. They're still coming at it from an energy standpoint, and they're coming at it with science. And this is now a public health debate. And when I look at the amount of science coming out of Colorado, it's all based on air quality. I mean, not all, but a lot is based on air quality and noise pollution and et cetera. Um, have you thought about that, about how this is almost, almost seems like it, it is a public health debate now? Boy, that's a, that's a real good point. You're, you, you're actually the first person I've heard to talk about it that way, and it does make a lot of sense. So I guess even the climate change activists... When you take a look at the headlines, the way that the headlines have been framed in the last six months, right. it, it is... I mean, you know me, I've, I've been on this for five years, and to me, this has been, uh, been on the smoking ban template, the whole deal, and that's exactly what the smoking ban was, was a public health debate. And, and that's what I, I, I've just, I've noticed that in the last six months. They flip, right around when Greta came around, is when, when, when Greta Thunberg came around, it's like they almost switched the language and the conversation to a public health debate. So anyway, um, yeah, just your thoughts on that. Well, that's, that's a good point. I really hadn't thought about it. I do know, historically, obviously, there's been a lot of arguments with regard to air pollution and ozone and particulate matters and the contributions of the um, oil sector to that. And actually, when you say that, it really hasn't been highlighted as a public health debate. But I know, you know, whenever you're around any petroleum uh, vapors, I mean, they all you all have benzene, you have xylene, you have ethyl benzene, um, stuff that's not good for you. And, you know, whether whether you're pumping into your gas tank or whether you're, you know, you're you're pumping it into a tank at the at the well location, uh, you know, that is that is a public health impact. Now, now, how great it is, you know, Lord knows, I think it's pretty minor in the scheme of things as far as what we're exposed to that are potentially hazardous. But um, but it, it's been and I will agree with you also that I think. I think oil and gas is losing, the, uh, and it's bothersome to me. And I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure, Jason. The, you know, if I had a game plan, I mean, I, I'd make a terrible coach because I'm not quite sure what type of play I call and whether I, you know, use offense or defense or both or punt the ball or go for the 50-yard field goal. I just don't know because it, it's troubling to me because I realize having studied all this, how important energy is to economic growth, how important it is to the United States economically, to mineral owners, to individual owners, to... Um, oh, and it's a tough message to to even get across to the industry because they're used to dealing with politicians who understand spreadsheets and economic growth and community building, etc. And... Now, these very same politicians are working against them because of the public health debate. And where they're, they're, I mean, not all of them, but a lot of them are. And that's kind of what's, they're using emotion, whereas the industry is still kind of going with fact. And that is a, boy, I, if, if you can figure out how to, how to sell fact over emotion, you're going to make, you know, a million bucks because, Emotion over facts been going around since the dawn of man. <laughs> yeah, you're exactly right. You know, and it's, it's yeah, to get people act on emotions than it is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it is, and you know, and and they're using like fear, a lot of fear-based 
uh, emotion. And that's, that's where I, you know me, I get, I get really upset when you use kids and, and pander your way to profit with, with uh, fear and that sort of thing. And, but that's kind of what's, that, that's, that's in vogue right now. And that's what's happening. Uh, I, I do w- want to ask you a little bit about your thoughts when it comes to flaring and natural gas, because that's the next step. If, you know, right now they're using like cancer studies linking to oil and gas and the sites and all that different stuff. So they've got a, gr- they've got a pretty good um, arsenal coming with round one. But round two, they kind of put flaring as, you know, kind of in, on the back burner a little bit for, for their uh, arsenal to come at. But states, on the other hand, and oil and gas companies, they're still looking at that as, hey, we got to take care of this. Uh, oil and gas companies, they want to profit on it. Mineral owners want to profit on it. Uh, the marketplace wants to get, you know, whether it's CNG, LNG, or some kind of plastic uh, to, to or energy with natural gas to, to the market. So... Uh, where, where are you at when it comes to natural gas and flaring? I know you've attended a lot of conferences lately and you've been checking out a lot of different innovation uh, when it comes to the flaring side of things. Uh, talk to me about your flaring experiences. Well, actually, the, uh, if you look at the amount of, of gas that's being flared, it's pretty substantial in Texas, especially in the North Dakota. And so one of my cohorts, uh, Jim James Coleman, is professor at SMU, wrote a recent editorial and he's he's sort of proposing that maybe we ought to look at uh, you know back in the old days we used to have proration for oil because we had too much oil and we limit everybody's production maybe we ought to do something similar for natural gas that sounds pretty complicated to me and um then of course i talked to him a little bit and said gee you know you love this jason it's uh i said well maybe we want anything yet you flare your tax We'll just tax it at two dollars an MCF. And of course, he went nuts. He he's a sort of a free market guy, and I am too. But I, I just sort of pull his leg. And I about had a heart attack when yeah, you said that. Yeah, just yeah. just joking there. <laughs> yeah. The the problem is the problem is is you know well part of the problem is number one um, you know you put a tax on it and you know, then people aren't going to even care whether it's leaking out the you know the back forty pipeline uh, number one and number two once you put a tax on it it'll never get taken off. Uh, even though you build out the pipelines, because really what we want to do is build out pipelines. And they're, what is happening now is a lot of pipeline companies, you're build, you've seen the oil lines being built out because they can get you know, volumes committed. And they're from companies that are economically viable. But uh, for natural gas, when you're selling, I haven't looked at it today, but it was you know $2.15 or somewhere around, around like that. It's difficult to get companies to commit to you know, certain volumes of gas over time. So if you're a pipeline company, you don't want to spend you know, a couple hundred million dollars on a gas pipeline when you're not sure, you know, it's going to be economically viable. And on top of that, in the Permian, and I don't know if this is true in the Bakken or not, but in the Permian, there's some companies that are just giving their gas away. There's some companies that are actually paying to have the gas taken away. Um, and then the other alternative is, is flaring. And of course, the other alternative is shutting in your well but if you shut in your oil well because of the natural gas you know then you have questions with regard to drainage you have questions with regard to you know from what i understand once you frack the well um if you shut it in you know they the cracks start to heal the fractures and so as they start to heal it means that when you turn it on you know instead of getting a thousand barrels you're only going to get you know 875 so your economics sort of get screwed up so um yeah to me i know and i know i can tell you i've talked to the texas regulators that i mean at the very top of the railroad commission i've talked to some of the top regulators in north dakota and they all say they said joe you know well they said number one they said you know they have a huge concern about it and there's been a lot of new natural gas liquid facilities put online or coming online that have helped but they you know, haven't helped enough and the regulators also told me just you know over a beer i said you know industry would do well if they would just shut this you know stuff in however they have to do it because from a regular regulator standpoint from a public optics standpoint as you just noted you know people would say hey look you know there's the cancer flare that you know of the or that school children's money from you know state minerals that we're flaring that 
Um, in Texas, it's about $1.8 million a day of royalties you know, for, to state lands that are being flared. That's, you know, two, two million a day. That pays for a few teachers, uh, including Nevada, Texas, and you know, including me. <laughs> anyway, uh, that, that's, <laughs> that's beside the point. But uh, anyway, that's, as you know, as an industry and as a regulators in the industry, we have to be more and more concerned about our image because, well, and, and maybe rightfully so. I mean, but I think everything is cyclical, and I think the the ball has gone a little bit too far um, in one direction, anti oil versus, you know, maybe twenty or thirty years ago, maybe it was a little bit too pro oil and you know, less concerned about the environment and people's property rights. But it's a, it's a fascinating trade-off between government regulation and private rights, development, and, you know, the right you have if you, you know, have natural gas to, to flare it at, at will under your lease or under your minerals. So, um, but I do think it will be, it, actually the railroad commissioner uh, slot that's open uh, in November it will be. This will be a very, very hot issue between you know, the Texas the, Railroad Commission. Yeah, the Red, Texas Railroad Commission. That'll be a very hot issue for whoever you know gets the final slots to run for that. So, well, our slogan in 2020 is "Ready for anything" because huh. it's. Oh, it is. It, I mean, you have to be ready for anything. It's they're they're, they're using kids in order to usher in. Um, regulations and 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 narratives and um you know with, with trump you never know what's going to happen there and so it's just it's it's ready for anything and who knows how how things are going to you know you got layoffs happening you got automation being ushered in so um people who are getting jobs they're going from hundred thousand dollar jobs down to forty thousand dollar a year jobs so they're trying to adjust there. Yeah, I mean, I'm seeing. I'm telling you, man, ready for anything in 2020. And um, I wanted to ask you about, you know, along those same lines, ready for anything. We might there might be more protests coming up in the next year. I'm seeing a lot more stories on that. That, of course, when people aren't working, they're gonna they're gonna go protest. They need to feel like they're they're useful. North Dakota is familiar with their protests, with the Keystone XL protest. In fact, I was talking to someone recently where they said that kind of springboarded other states' protests. And so pipelines, when you look at the history of pipelines, uh, they were being put in no problem all the time until the Keystone one. Now you got natural gas pipelines being protested and things like that. So uh, the pipelines are very important. So my question is, with the protesters, the election year, with, you know, ready for anything, the natural gas industry, what they're keeping their eye on is the pipelines, Corpus Christi, and Lake Charles. Because if they can get those done, then you can open up into Mexico, you can, you can tap into the overseas. You got Trump signing the China deal, so they're, they're waiting for some LNG products. Um, that, that's how I kind of look at, at the natural gas that, you know, if it's almost like if they, in just another year and it's just going to explode from my standpoint, I don't know. Yeah, that's a good point. Actually, we have so much gas in the Permian there in New Mexico and, you know, that will, those will open up, you know, some outlets and actually will help a lot, I think, but you got to keep a, be aware too, that, you know, gee, we have so much natural gas back in Ohio and Pennsylvania and West Virginia, and those pipelines up there, you know, they're they're in Quagmire City, you know, from what I've heard with regard to protests, with regard to permitting. Um, they're building out, and I really haven't, I really haven't kept track as closely as I should up there. But just talking to people that are involved up in drilling up there, they just say it's still a mess trying to get. You know, number one, there's a lot of gas there um, that's easy to get to. The problem is, you know, you're gathering in transportation system, your pipelines, which, you know, just like the Permian now are are falling a bit short. And so the, again, your economics are really uh, are really tilted toward oil. And I actually told my class last week that I, you know, one of the things when you drill, if you look at the number of drilling rigs that are active, which were down 24% year over year but almost 95 percent of them jason they're all they're all drilling for oil 
And because that's where the economics are, you can market the oil, even if even if you have to truck it off your site. If you get a gas well in the pipeline and gathering system, you can't get it hooked up. You know, it could be a year, two, three years before you start getting any revenue. And that is, that is not something you want to see. Joe Dancy with us, our energy educator and expert, talking about all things energy. We go all over the gamut from oil and gas to flaring to social media oh we haven't talked social media yet oh yeah we teased about that we got to get right to that i was going to ask you about something else but we'll talk about that later social media now i I don't want to get too much into this because we're already over a half hour here but that's quite okay uh because it's podcast world we can do whatever we want um the social media side of things you know there's there's been layoffs and there's been some downturn tickings etc not everybody, you know, there's still still a lot of activity. North Dakota is still putting a million barrels. Texas is putting their theirs out, you know. I mean, things are still happening. But I'm starting to see some posts on social media where this company isn't paying this guy and this contract is being broken and this company is a snake oil salesman here. And um, I myself, I've got, you know, I'm I'm – I've got a few companies behind on some receivables, but I, I understand what's going on. So I'm not doing anything either or mentioning anything. Um, what do you make about that? Uh, you being involved with the, the legal world that you are, um, there's some activity on these social media sites arguing whether it's slander or not. And I, I kind of admit, I just get a kick out of it. But uh uh, I, I'm sure you've seen this or, or have heard of it, or it's not. I'm not the first one to bring it up. I know that, but it is a new area. It's it's a gray area, and uh, just want to get your comments on that. Yeah, actually, as the industry <laughs> slows down, you and I have been we've been around long enough to know. You know, historically, of course, we didn't have social media, but historically, when things slow down, whether you're taking leases or paying for land work or curative or drilling. You know, everybody starts to slow pay. I mean, you don't, you know, you don't get everything paid in two weeks. It takes, you know, a month or two months. Or, and actually, there's some companies, and I won't name companies, but um, that are relatively large. So, I mean, they, they historically have made sort of a, a policy that uh, when things slow down, you know, you'll get paid, but it'll be three months from now or longer. And, uh, but you didn't have the social media aspect and of course you and i are connected to so many people in the energy sector but if we were in the auto sector um, that might not be a good example i think autos are slowing too but if we were in the pharmacy sector for example or medical we probably wouldn't see some of these posts that are you know complaining and i i I do know i mean the basic rule with regard to slander and libel and defamation is you know truth is always an absolute defense and so If I owe you $5,000 and haven't paid and you post something out there that, you know, got one of my guests, Dancy, you know, owes me 5,000 bucks and he hasn't, and I guess, let me make it real clear, I don't, I don't pay you for these interviews. (laughs) Maybe I should, maybe I should, Jason, but just for the listeners, if I did owe Jason 5,000, if I owed you $5,000 and you posted and I got mad and threatened to sue and contacted LinkedIn and told them or, or Facebook, uh, the, the, you could absolutely, you know, if I went forward with any type of action, you could just, you know, go to court and say, judge, you know, here's the, you know, here's what the services and here's the agreement. And, um, that one of the problems you have in that is, is, I mean, I may dispute the agreement and I, and I guess this, I've heard this before and I'm in with lease brokers where, you know, people will, well, gee, yeah, we, you know, they owe me like day, you know, weeks worth of day rate. And, and of course the company's defense is, well, we told you we needed it by Tuesday and you, you gave it to us on Friday. So it was worthless. So we really don't owe you anything. So that's, so that gets to be a, a, a problem too. And I have seen a, one of my good uh, professor buddies uh, uh, told me, you know, gee, in some of these small cases where and I, every state is different on limitations, but they have what are called small claims court, where essentially you just file yourself. You don't need a lawyer. You go claim, and I, I think it's up four or five thousand dollars, maybe more. But it's, um, I know I had a good friend who, actually, well, this is sort of relevant. He is, he was driving his little car, and you know, a a truck that was hauling gravel to a well site 
it's like one of the big rocks fell off and broke his windshield and you know he stopped the driver and the driver said i'll go jump in the lake so he filed a small claims and they went and argued and the judge awarded him you know a couple hundred dollars to replace his his windshield based on the fact the rock fell off and he took a picture of the truck and the company and the license plate number of the truck and um so but if you have a contract and you, and, and again um you know apparently it's fairly simple to do and i have a number of friends that have well actually when i was back in private practice practicing law you know, they come to me and they go gee we you know we have a dispute over five hundred dollars and we want to hire you and it's like dude you don't really want to hire me because by the time i write everything up get it filed you pay all the fees we go argue about it all you know you're you you're gonna pay me more money than it's worth so why don't you just take everything i'll help you to the extent i can file a small claims uh, um, and, and, and most of them it, even when that sometimes the judge will take the cake and he'll see there's an argument or she'll see there's an argument but she'll also see the G you know maybe they owed the money but maybe the product you know was somewhat late or defective and you know we'll cut the cake and say well gee you know you you owe five hundred dollars but based on the fact that it was late or the product isn't quite what they expected you know we're only going to give you a judgment for 300 and so everybody sort of walks away either half happy or half half <laughs> upset but uh in any event it's, that is an option to do that but i do know uh, on a number of social media sites like facebook and um and linkedin i assume twitter also if there's any anybody post anything real negative well number one if it's on your post you can actually delete it and every once in a while it got the last in the last year i think i only had to delete a couple posts one of which started <laughs> you'll appreciate this they really weren't rambling they weren't ups, they were upset i don't know if they were upset with me but they were really upset with the institution that i was teaching at and went on to talk about what a bunch of incompetent you know nimcompoops these people are at this university and i looked at it and said you know we i really can't i can't well it, they weren't attacking me but it, and i don't know if it was liable or not I mean, if it, if the truth again truth is the is the uh so anyway, i deleted it and, and I, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm sorry i put that out there i was it was late at <laughs> night i was i wasn't sure what i was doing i think i mixed up my medication no, i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> Dakota, you guys, you know, you can pick on everybody, so that's that's good. But uh, anyway, uh, it it, uh, it, was, no. it was interesting. But, but I, I, I do get where they're coming from, though, um, because I, I want to believe that they posted it to, to let their colleagues know, hey, you know, if you've got bills to pay and you've got this and you've, you're relying on this, these, these are the names of the companies that aren't doing this. Um, but I could see where the average person, and I'd probably be in the average person, would say, that's just kind of tacky. <laughs> yeah, I'm sort of the same way. It is, it is uh, on the other hand, I mean, it is sort of like, a, you know, you're going down the highway and someone, you know, slams on the brakes and, you know, it, it you are in the, you know, if you're relying on a stream of revenue to pay your overhead and pay your office and, you know, it's um, and pay your employees. You know, the fact that you have some slow pays, I mean, it really does sort of you know, causes a huge sort of traffic jam, so to speak. Which is, you know, it, it, number one, it's annoying, and number two, it actually can be. You know, I guess to take the analogy, it's sort of dangerous to your financial health, just like a, a, a you know a, a slamming on the brakes on a snowy highway would be. But. Uh, in any event, it, I have seen that. It's, it's funny that you mentioned that because it's it's something I haven't seen in the last five or ten years, hardly at all. And it, oh no, it, it's taboo. I it, mean, it's it, it's kind of it taboo. Is, that, that that's why I bring it up because these are you know that that not only is the industry changing, but the perception of the industry is changing. So the crude life's taken on conversations that the industry's really never had before because, uh -huh. you know, well, blockchain's going to change a lot of this, you know, when it comes to contracts and, and, and this type of stuff. And then there's right. going to, there's going to be new industry standards set in with social media um, in terms of, Hey, who knows? Maybe this might be the thing that people want. I, I don't think so. I think it'll probably lose out, but um, 
it sure got people's attention. You and I both noticed uh, several posts. You know what I mean? Right. So it's right. the industry's changing. The industry's changing. So I mean, it's um, yeah. Like, like I said, man, be ready for anything in 2020. <laughs> well, I mean, part of the problem is, I mean. I totally understand too, Jason. I mean, the industry being what it is, it's so cyclical that, you know, I can understand easily companies or individuals becoming extended to the extent that, you know, they can't cut the check today. But on the other hand, you know, the way you handle that diplomatically is you just tell us like, look, dude, you know, we've lost 75% of our business because they're not leasing up here um, in the scoop and stack anymore, for example. And we will pay you, but you're just going to have to be patient because, you know, we, we, yeah, we just don't have the money in the, and at least that way people are reassured. Although historically, like I say, going back, you know, a number of years, you know, generally the companies don't reassure you. They just sort of just, they won't answer your phone calls. They won't answer your letters. You, you know, and you're just wondering, am I going to get paid? Am I not going going to get paid? Are they just screwing me around because they think they can take advantage of me? And I'll teach them. I can see people say, hey, I'll teach them. I'll post it on, on uh, social media that they're not paying their bills, which, again, as you know, I mean, even if it's even if there's no legal issues involved with it or, or you're not breaking any of the, um, the uh, social media standards or ethics or whatever they um you're supposed to sign off on uh it is sort of tacky <laughs> but, it, it is, but, it, but it is i got it i just like you i read it it's like man i don't most of these people i don't know so it's i not really familiar with them or the companies but it's like man i'm glad my name's not in there <laughs> yeah i mean i you know I'll, I'll be honest um when i see that i generally think of like a almost like a lover's quarrel like when, when a boyfriend and a girlfriend break up or somebody gets divorced and how they handle it on social media, um, some of them go right at the other person and start, you know, start listing their indiscretions and shortcomings right on their Facebook page and things like that. And it, it kind of reminded me a little bit of that. And I think a lot of people are in that same boat. And But again, at the same time, I think a lot of people can sympathize and even empathize to a certain degree that okay well you know that's kind of a uh, i looked at it as just another sign that um you know there's there's some some tightening of the belts going on once again in the industry and there's no secret i mean we've had a lot of layoffs and you know there's been a lot of news stories i think the dallas fed came out and even gave out a warning last quarter so i mean this isn't you know this isn't new news this isn't optimism talk and i know how a lot of people in the industry they don't like it if you don't do optimism talk. So um, anyway, I just, it, interesting topic, that's for sure. I wanted to, talk, I wanted to ask you about another topic. Uh, so we'll put that one to bed because we want to wrap up here. But uh, bat lives matter. Wind energy and the issue with bats. You mentioned that that came up in a paper that you guys were studying because you know me, I I'm in, I, I will protect the bats and I will protect the desert tortoise and 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 all the animals and things along those lines because you know hey they 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 they, they need someone to protect them too, um, but at the same time hey <laughs> we gotta we, we gotta live our lives too but uh, did did you did you mention that to me a bat thing I mentioned yeah I mentioned there there's actually I'm using a new case book now that I'm uh, teaching energy law I, the last couple years I've got used in in the it'll be actually this is a case we're gonna have later this week where um, <laughs> there was a wind turbine company that apparently their wind turbines were killing a bunch of bats and so some environmentalist organization files a lawsuit and they claim, you know, there's a big, there's a big um, dispute uh, between there's a legislation promoting wind energy. There's also legislation protecting uh, some bat species. And apparently, and I didn't just reading the, reading the case that's in the book and they cut a lot of out. Apparently these wind turbines, they just don't kill one bat. They kill like, bunches of them i mean i don't you know yeah, i'm not a bad expert but but a million a year in the u.s so it's interesting that the the court had to come the court was like 
what are we going to do? You know, because we have these two contra- contradictory um, statutes and policies, one to promote wind energy, one to protect the bat. And so what they did is they issued a um, temporary injunction, which just says you need to shut down the wind turbine until, you know, we can take testimony and determine whether to let this thing continue to operate or not. I don't, you know, if you're killing, I mean, I just can't see that they would, how you can let, you know, under the legislation that's protecting these bats, if you know they're being killed, I don't know how, you know, I would expect the wind turbine will be shut down or somehow well, okay, here's renovated, a, but that's just my guess. But that, it was it, it's an interesting case, the fact that you brought it up on LinkedIn or somewhere, I thought was very interesting because it is a, it's an issue that, well, here's why it's an issue. Um, they don't, the, the, the government doesn't care if you kill birds. So they don't, including eagles. It's bats they care about because bats have a lot to do with agriculture. Bats are very responsible for pollinating and protecting or keeping the insect population at bay. And so there's, if you go through court cases, the reason that wind turbines have to care about bats but not birds it has to do with agriculture and so there's an actual dollar amount in every county in the united states you can have a dollar amount on what the impact or the economic impact is of bats so i i guarantee you that's why well, that's fascinating I, I, I just uh i thought it was i have seen cases i will say um dealing with wind turbines dealing with noise pollution where that's the thing. Tell, and I haven't been I haven't been around. I've actually gotten out and when I was in Iowa it to try to and I it seemed to be pretty quiet to me, but apparently depending on the type of wind turbine you have and the wind and everything else, apparently so, those things get pretty darn noisy. Well they not only get they get noisy, but uh, the the noise pollution actually is is a low frequency that we don't hear is the actual noise pollution where the problem comes. And it has to do with the low frequency. So in in the same way that a dog whistle, the humans can't hear it, and dogs can, uh, the low frequency, we can't hear it, but other things can, and actually it can cause uh, damage because the frequency is so low that it can, it can cre- I don't know, now you're getting into quantum physics with vibrations and uh, 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 I'll be honest, sometimes I kind of, I lose track when I have the guests on because I'm like, okay, these guys are getting way too smart here and I'm losing track. So, um, you know, my, my notes can't go so fast, but, but the, the short answer is, is that the noise pollution, the main part of it, honestly, has to do with the low frequency part of it and so they're trying to figure out the health implications behind that but again if you don't see it and you don't hear it it doesn't you know it's no big deal no big deal (laughs) well that's why they had to isn't that true about um, natural gas they they put that sulfur smell in there so you know yep yeah exactly when it leaks yeah otherwise no one would pay attention to it and they just you know light up their stogie or you know or whatever they're doing now or i don't i don't even know if people smoke anymore um because they're they got to do it in back alleys like modern day lepers. Um, <laughs> it is, oh yeah. I mean, that's yeah. it's kind of the, at least up in this part of the country and in California and other places. But well, let's see what's going on in your world. I'll give you the kind of last word, the last thought here as I look at the clock, and we're nearing sixty minutes. So, uh, any any conferences that you're attending that you've seen, just kind of take the floor here a little bit and uh, uh, give yourself a plug and what you're going to be doing. No, geez, it's it's pretty. Uh, I've been really pretty busy. I've been up uh, Upper Michigan looking at solar installations again, and it's sort of interesting to see how the snow impacts that up there. And taking a look, and actually, we're I'm talking like, to a university up there about setting up an energy center because just you know almost all the stuff that we've talked about today, Jason, has huge policy implications, and you know there I think there's an opportunity for a unbiased uh, group of experts to take a look at everything from wind turbines to solar to the electric grid to pumped mine storage of of, uh, um, power uh, and take a look and actually put together some really good research that uh, would be viable and it's not some type of um, you know global climate alarmist type of 
you know, we need to shut everything down type of uh, attitude. But so I'm going to be working on that. We're going to, there'll be a big announcement in February and it'll be curious. I'll still be working here at Texas A&M and at, in here in Fort Worth and uh, also at SFU in Dallas where I'm teaching energy law. And we have a, the new online program for uh, get a master's in energy law from Texas A&M. That's what they hired me for. They said, hey, it's pretty funny. The, uh, they, they, they knew I was in Dallas and they knew I came back from Oklahoma on uh, they said the first thing they saw when I came back is like the dean said, "Hey, give this guy a call. We want him teaching over here online." So it's uh, so it's sort of exciting. To, exciting, although as you know, with the industry slowing, um, it's not as fun as it. It's never as fun when things are going slower, and you're worried about paying your bills as when you know you're accelerating and drilling rig counts are up and people are inviting you to parties because they're expanding their office and calling and you know gee you know any landman we want to hire three of them and it's like i haven't heard that conversation now and i'm in about six or nine months so it's uh and but but it's coming it's all cyclical as you know i like to remind people about the story of wrigley gum which was there was a time i think it was world war ii the government banned chewing gum for whatever reason they needed the material or the workers but wrigley advertised and they were the only company that advertised you couldn't even buy gum and Wrigley kept advertising and then when the gum came back on the market I think they got 85 percent of the market share right out of the gate because everybody assumed the other companies went out of business and Wrigley just kept so the thing about the downturn is is you got if, if you can somehow stay relevant and and keep yourself out there you'll 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 get you know you'll get rewarded once once things come back around. So uh, also you mentioned uh, about the independent research and that sort of thing. That was, that was one of the issues I started clamoring about about five years ago, which was the one thing that the, the climate industry seems to have when it comes to their science is they don't do verified data like the way that drug companies were forced to do and, you know, other companies at least somewhat of an independent research on data a lot of the climate research was never third party validated and and that sort of thing and the data a lot of the data is not open to the public that are funded by uh tax dollar grants and things like that so there's it seems like there's you know a lot of politics when it comes to verified data so uh it's interesting that you talked about you know independent verification of data or or you know research that sort of thing well, it's real important because it is interesting. One of the concerns I have is that you listen to different opinions on, say, climate change and renewables, and you know, are they trying to sell you solar cells, or do they really believe this is you know the way to go for the electric grid or whatever? And you you really don't know. And and you know the studies that they use, you know, if I give you a grant for a million dollars to study climate change and i want you to tell me we have climate change issues and we have to make i guarantee you you will do whatever you can do to come to that conclusion to keep me happy so you get another grant that's sort of where we sort of where the academic and the research area has gone in my opinion although that's just my opinion but i think a third party you know more neutral eyes on the and especially utilizing some engineering professors that are very well versed um, as well as policy professors well, I think we can I think we can put a good a really good team together and it's uh, so far I think it's I'm excited although we haven't kicked off the ball yet you just really brought up an excellent point which I've never heard it really put together in that way you know you can always put together a puzzle but it looks different each time so um, what you said was, okay, when it comes to a lot of these different renewables, and what I wrote down after that was, you don't know whether they're coming at you because it's good for the grid or whether they want to sell solar cells or if they're trying to keep the grant money. So it's really a three-headed approach. I mean, you, you said two, but you actually named three. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. I didn't even think about that. Well, because that, that is true. A lot of times they're just trying to keep their grant money. Yep. 
So oh, you, you, you don't know if it's good for the grid or whether they're trying to keep their grant money or whether they're just trying to sell you a solar cell because it's a public-private partnership. Yeah, exactly. Huh. It, it, or they're an in, in installer. It's a, it is interesting, Jake, to, to throw on that story. They had a, um, down here in Cedar Hill, Texas, they had a, uh, at City Hall, they had a solar uh, weekend. And I went down and listened to some solar installers talk about you know why you should put solar on your house and you know according to them if you put a solar system on your house the value will immediately go up 20 percent and then i talked to a realtor in the same area and she told me you put a solar system on your house and the value will go down at least 10 to 15 percent because people don't want to deal with you know, a bunch of wires sticking on a roof that you have to hook up to the electric system. And, a, and it's sort of interesting. So you got, you know, the people that install it are sort of talking there. Oh, yeah, this is great. It's going to increase the value. And the realtors are saying, you know, Dancy, don't touch that with a 10-foot pole. Even for educational purposes, you're going to lose your shirt. So, um, and and they both, you know, appear to believe what they're saying. So it's, uh, um, again, you're talking, yeah, you're talking, your interest versus, um, yeah, versus uh, what is reality possibly. So, all right, one last question um, on LinkedIn. You've got, or on either LinkedIn or Facebook, you've got twenty five thousand followers, don't you? I got thirty seven thousand. Oh. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm limited out pretty much. At uh, I got more followers, but I can't have any more connections. And yeah, this all started about five years ago. A, a number of my ex-students started sending me reports that I put the link to said, gee, here's a report from, I won't mention it, but they're pretty, a lot of them are in the financial business or energy business. And so and I didn't realize how popular they got. And then I started putting up a little history write-ups because that's part of my, it's all in my classes. So it's like, well, gee, on today, you know, today we had, you know, the Cardwell blew out and Ohio about 90 years ago and it started the big Finley, Ohio, you know, and, and people just, uh, they really enjoy it and they, and they get a lot of feedback because well, even in North Dakota, when the first, I can't remember when they drilled the first well up there, but I post it and you'd be surprised that people that, gee, my grandfather worked there or, you know, God, I grew up in that town and I knew exactly where it's at or, or gee, Standard Oil came in and bought everybody out. And we all got rich, or my, you know, my parents did, and and so you get a lot of contacts. And people send you private messages with, you know, sort of more private type of uh, reminiscence of what uh, goes on. And to me, it's fantastic because then I can go out and when I'm speaking to different groups or speaking to my students, I can tell them, you know, these stories that. I assume are true, and I can sort I sort of follow them up to make sure you know, they have some grain of truth to them, and say, "Geez, you know, this is what happened, and this is on this day, and this you know, illustrates the rule of capture." And by the way, you know, some people in the area told me, you know, in addition, this is what happened. That that adds even more color, and and uh, it makes it more relevant. And I, I know my classes, my classes. Well, the reason I teach at all these different institutions is the students. Just I mean, my classes. I end up starting with 10 students and then two years later i have 70. so because the students think it's interesting and i present it in a relevant way and they they look at it too jason as you know it's like well gee maybe i can make a career out of the energy sector or renewable sector or the environmental whatever they want to do they they think the topics that i'm talking about are interesting and they're relevant and they are because it's energy is you can't get more relevant than energy um, and that's why it's exciting what you're doing. That's what, why it's exciting what I'm doing. Excellent, because we're going to be starting the 25K Club here very shortly. It's the, well, just on the crude life we are, the 25K Club. It's 25, you know, we'll have a weekly segment where we talk to somebody who's got 25,000 followers or friends or whatever because, I don't know, apparently that means you're an influencer in today's day and age, I'm told. I mean, I've got... Let's see, about 27,000 plus the crude life. So, you know, because, you know, the two different sites. And then over on the Facebook side, I'm close to 200,000 with our different sites. And, wow. uh, and then you throw in the YouTubes and you throw in a few others, you know. And the thing is, each one is, is different, you know. Like um, LinkedIn is not the same as Facebook, for example. So you, you have to approach them almost differently. But... Uh, I was very much like you. I, I, I actually only, only went on Facebook, I think, a year, two years ago, two and a half years ago. Right. 
And I just started posting my interviews and same thing. People were sending me messages and following me. And, and then about, yeah, it was actually last year I realized I better get one for the crude life. And so I just started one for the crude life and, um, and going, oh, you know, you got to start from the beginning again. But it, it, you've been told by people the value of uh, 25000 plus when it comes to social media, haven't you? Actually, it's worth a lot of money. To yeah, it is. If you, and actually, if you bought that advertising for your for your demographics, it's real positive. I'm excited. I, I'm, I guarantee you, I will listen. Anybody who has 25,000, actually anybody who has like over 15,000 connections, they're probably a pretty interesting person. Now, you might not agree with what, you know, what they're saying, but the fact that they have that many, they have some credibility and they're probably going to to deliver a message that's going to have some interest. I would, um, I would, you know, I don't know if you have sponsors for that, but I would, I would think you should be able to get a, yeah, some sponsors for, um, yeah, that that. <clears throat> All right. So how could uh, what's your LinkedIn and uh, social media if people want to reach out? Uh, just to, just search me on just search me on LinkedIn, and that's uh, that'll get uh, that'll get me, and I I'll be happy to. I'll be happy to interact, put it that way. <laughs>